strive to live my life by a single rule, to treat everyone around me with as much deep and abiding compassion as possible. Over the past several years, my quest to find compassion has been a guiding force in my life, helping me alleviate stress, find purpose, and attain true personal happiness and contentment. My philosophy is similar to our school's policy of non-city, prominently featured on our school's seal. non sibi is Latin for not for oneself. Two years ago, when I first started seriously practicing my philosophy of kindness, I was looking for practical solutions to live a life of non sibi How does one tackle this seemingly insurmountable task, considering the weight of every action that we do, considering the impact of our actions on other people, not hurting another soul, serving this global cause of happiness greater than the individual? To find answers, I turned to science. The human brain, perhaps the most complex, intricate, and powerful form of intelligence in the universe. And it sits between your ears. Roughly three and a half pounds, it is composed of 86 billion neurons, each of which are sending electrical and chemical signals to other neurons to communicate. These signals, electrical and chemical, define everything we do, our hopes, our dreams, our future, and they make us who we are. If that's true, I'm curious, what can neuroscience research, studying the structures of the brain, how these neurons connect, what can that tell us about leading lives of non sibi Can understanding biologically what empathy is, what clues can that give us to leading lives of non sibi here are the two major takeaways I had from decades of research. Number one, everyone has an innate capacity for empathy. We just have to figure out how to activate it. And number two, we can activate it by training our brain to view compassion as a reward and building habits of compassion. So first, everyone, every single person in this room has an innate capacity for empathy. What do I mean by that? This is the brain. You're viewing a sagittal slice of the brain. Split the brain down the middle, you're looking at half. At the top, you can see the cortex or the cerebrum. It's involved in higher cognitive processes and sensory integration. At the bottom, the cerebellum, which is involved in motor function. What we want to focus on is the middle, the limbic system, largely composed of the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the brainstem. This is just a collection of neurons, and it's involved in a vast variety of functions in the brain, one of which includes empathy. Specifically, the two highlighted areas, the anterior cingulate cortex and the anterior insular cortex. These areas have been consistently implicated in processing empathy and compassion. And these areas are ancient. Let's travel back in time. 250 million years ago, during Pangaea, the very first mammals, the cynodonts, evolved from the laid reptiles, the thoracids. During this process of evolution, scientists believe the thalamus cingulate division of the limbic system came into existence, these very same, same brain structures that we're talking about. This allowed for mammals to develop behaviors and traits such as placentation, which is internal development of the fetus, and caring for the young until they reach reproductive age, a mammalian version of parental care. This evolution of mammalian parental care allowed these animals to have heightened sensitivity to the emotions of others. Emotional cues and signals, such as pain and distress. And that evolved to what we today, in the modern world, call our human form of empathy. Ultimately, the same neuronal circuits that once allowed a mother and father to love their child, now allow us to process the emotions of other people, to perform empathy. Clearly, empathy is ancient. This evolved millennia before higher cognitive processes. 
It is hardwired deep into our brains. It is part of the framework upon which the rest of our brain is built. Now you're viewing a functional magnetic resonance image, or an fMRI scan. This is recording neural, neuronal activity in the brain. And Mordino Yang et al. found that when subjects performed acts of compassion, the neurons in these two areas, the anterior insular cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex, were throwing parties, activating, lighting up, left, right, and center. These results were reproduced by Singer and Flamecki. Again, these same two areas, which are ancient, hardwired deep into our brain, were lighting up. Fascinatingly enough, these areas of the brain are using oxytocin as the neurotransmitter, the chemical messenger. Oxytocin is the same neurotransmitter involved in love. And it's also involved in processing our own pain signals. So ultimately, at the end of the day, when we see someone else in pain, the same neurons in our brain light up as if we were in pain ourselves. Each of us has this ability. We just have to figure out how to activate it. That brings me to my second big takeaway. We can train our brains to lead more compassionate lives through small but repetitive acts of kindness. This is the reward system of the brain, just another collection of neurons devoted to a specific function. This time, it's processing almost any reward signal, a signal of pleasure, joy, or ecstasy. At the base of the brain, you have two collections of neurons, your substantia nigra pars compacta and your ventral tegmental area. These areas are connected to a diverse group of structures throughout the brain, primarily your nucleus accumbens, your prefrontal cortex, and your striatum. These systems are using dopamine as their neurotransmitter, a neurotransmitter that's quite infamous. But perhaps most importantly, these systems are involved in habit formation. Let me give a personal example. One of the great loves of my life, chocolate. <laughs> I find a Hershey's bar. I open the Hershey's bar. I take a bite. Oh my god. <laughs> the texture, the feel, the emotions. I'm in heaven. And my brain is in heaven too. The reward systems are lighting up. Again, they're throwing a party. I feel great. I take another bite. Dopamine is released in my brain. It's lighting up, throwing a party. I take another bite, and another bite, and another, and another, and another. And suddenly, I finish the bar. <laughs> Clearly, I've developed the habit, or an addiction, per se, of eating chocolate. Research shows that kindness works in much the same way. Kim and colleagues found that when you perform a compassionate act, the mesolimbic section of your reward system lights up, is activated, specifically the ventral striatum. These are again fMRI scans showing this activation. So what does this mean for us? Through this process called operant conditioning, if we perform daily acts of kindness, we can actually train our brain to recognize kindness as a reward. And if the brain likes a reward, if the brain makes something that makes the brain feel happy, well then the brain naturally wants more of it. Therefore, by performing daily acts of kindness, we can train our brain to develop a habit of compassion. Every single person in this room has a capacity to feel empathy, to connect with other people. We just have to figure out how to access these primeval ancient systems in our brain. Number two, we access them by performing small daily actions of kindness and building a habit of compassion. To this end, I'd like to announce a non city project. It's a project that I've collaborated with Ethel to develop, which will recognize and reward acts of compassion on our campus. Hopefully, together, we can cultivate a culture of compassion in our community. 
I'd like to invite everyone in this room to join me on our quest to find compassion. I hope that by sharing my philosophy today, together, we can all encode empathy into our lives. Thank you for your time.